Hey guys, I'm Aaron. I'm the guy that you've been listening to for the past four years. I mean, we've done 55 million views together, 215,000 subscribers. Your support has been absolutely insane. And to be honest, that's why I'm making this video, to talk to you. And I know I haven't been posting much over the past three months and I wanted to explain myself. I owe you guys an explanation. And here it is. Over the past three months, it's been kind of... Hold on, I gotta... I gotta... I gotta so. I had to check. Um, yeah, over the past three months, it's been kind of long and hard for me. I got sick there for a little bit. And then I was doing my master's in computer science and the course load was kind of high. And then on top of that, I had to travel to a bunch of different conferences in Regina and Calgary and things like that. It was really hard on me. And I just didn't have the time to make the videos that I want to make and tell the stories that I want to tell. And now, now that I'm done with a lot of that stuff, I have the time to make the videos that I want to make, tell the stories that I want to tell. And I hope you can understand that. I know I've been getting comments from you constantly over the last few months, like, hey, are you okay? Are you doing fine? And I truly do appreciate that. I truly do appreciate your support. Hell, if you're watching this right now, it means that, you know, I haven't been posting for three months and you came back. I truly do appreciate your support and everything even you know watching my videos i truly do appreciate it and i don't know what else to say thank you so much for watching my videos for liking commenting even if it's to tell me that i'm an idiot you know who you are but thank you so much for your support and i know i haven't said this in a while but this is the story of ethiopian airlines flight 645 let's watch the video on the 18th of july 2019 a Boeing 787 was flying from Manila's Nino International Airport all the way to Hong Kong International Airport. The flight was definitely medium haul, and within a couple of hours, the plane was getting close to Hong Kong International Airport. Now, the active runway for landings that day was runway 25, and getting to runway 25 required you to fly to the north and then turn to the left and then intercept the localizer of runway 25. If you don't know, the localizer is part of the ILS, or the instrument landing system, that uses radio beacons to guide the planes towards the runway. The ILS is made up of the glide slope and the localizer. The glide slope tells you if you're too high or too low on your way down to the runway, and the localizer tells you where you are in relation to the runway, horizontally. Both of them together keep you on track and gets you right down to the runway. For the ILS approach to runway 25, you needed to hit the waypoint named River, and then intercept the localizer. This would help them line up with runway 25. And from there, it would be a quick descent right down to the runway. And Bob's your uncle. The pilots of flight 645 flew the approach into runway 25. The plane was on autopilot as they approached the waypoint river. River was just 15 nautical miles from the runway. So they were getting ready to put this plane on the ground. The autopilot put the plane into a slight left bank as it picked up the beacon on the ground. The plane started following the beacons down to the runway. The landing was going smoothly. Then, they quickly scanned their instruments and came to a sobering realization. The plane was not descending towards the runway. It was headed straight for terrain. Somehow, the plane had not lined up with the runway, and it had also descended well below the minimum safe altitude for the area, which was set to 4,300 feet. If you don't know, the minimum safe altitude is the lowest altitude that you're allowed to descend to in a particular area. If you go below that, you're at risk of flying into something like a mountain. That was the case for Flight 645. They were in mountainous terrain, and the pilots did not feel like finding out where the mountains were with their 787. They immediately disengaged the autopilot, took manual control of the plane, and pushed the engines to max power. ATC noticed that Flight 645 was nowhere near the extended center line of runway 25. They saw that they were headed straight for terrain, and ATC immediately asked them to go around. Since the pilots were already climbing, the plane was out of danger, in very little time. They made a second approach to runway 25. It doesn't say if it was a manual approach or if the ILS was used, but regardless, they landed safely. Now, you might be wondering how close the 787 got to any terrain. Well, the lowest that they got was 3,277 feet, which is more than 1,000 feet below their minimum descent altitude. And the scary thing is that they missed a mountain by 0.3 miles. That is, 
If they were 0.3 miles to the right of where they actually were, they would have flown right into a mountain. That is absolutely scary to think about. You have to know, the 787 so far at the time of recording has an absolutely spotless safety record. There are literally thousands of 787s in service around the world, and not one hull has been lost. Sure, they got grounded for a bit in 2013 due to lithium battery fires, but it never took a plane down. Finding out why this happened would be key to keeping that safety record intact. Because next time there might not be two pilots who are as attentive, or an ATC who kept as close to watch as the one at Hong Kong. So they needed to get to the bottom of this. When something like this happens, a lot of wheels are set in motion. Some people look at the plane to see if there was something that could explain the deviation. Some others will look at the navigational equipment to see if that sent the jet astray. Then even others will look into the history of the plane if something like this had already happened. In the case of this incident, something very similar had happened to another 787 off the coast of Hong Kong. And they found more instances of the autopilot flight director system that had trouble locking onto the localizer signal. But first, let's look at the ILS system a little bit more closely. A beacon at the foot of the runway sends out a radio beam that the plane can then pick up and then fly along. That beam is known as the localizer. That's the one that we're interested in today. If you're established on the localizer, then that means that you're lined up with the runway. To make the autopilot capture the localizer beam, you have to put the plane into what's known as the LOC or lock mode. When this happens, the CLC or the consistent localizer capture function within the autopilot function software activates. The CLC is the software that makes sure that the plane is lined up with the localizer radio beam. The CLC is especially useful when you need to make a large turn to line up with the runway. The CLC makes sure that you don't overshoot the extended center line of the runway. And when the CLC has done its job, the CLC will hand over control to the LOC module, which is responsible for keeping the plane on the localizer. So, in short, the CLC makes sure that the plane gets on the localizer, and the LOC makes sure that the plane stays on the localizer lined up with the runway. Now that we understand what should have happened, let's look at what exactly happened with Flight 645. We see that the CLC mode was activated, and then it put the plane into the turn that was needed to line the plane up with the runway. But then, that crucial handover from the CLC to the LOC mode did not take place. Now, don't get me wrong, the CLC mode did its job. It turned the plane into a place where it could easily capture the localizer. But the LOC mode that actually did that was nowhere to be found. So they sent the data from the flights to Boeing to see if they could recreate the issue in their simulators. And they were able to. Boeing now had their work cut out for them. Why wouldn't this important bit of software engage in very specific circumstances? It was finicky. They found out that depending on the type of approach that was being flown, it could short out the computers on the plane. Well, not really short out computers in the traditional sense of the word. Depending on the shape of the approach that was being flown and the ground speed, the CLC mode would engage for a very short period of time. Now, the problem with this is that the CLC mode was activated for such a short period of time that the three FCMs or the flight control modules that control the plane would not have time to sync up to a common state, meaning that they all were not in agreement as to what mode the plane was in. Now, since all the flight control modules were in different modes, the software just kind of froze up like a deer in headlights. Thus, that crucial transition from the CLC mode to the LOC mode just did not happen. If you'll think back to a few minutes ago, then you'll know that the LOC mode is what makes sure that the plane stays lined up with the runway. Without that, the plane just went right through the extended center line of the runway and away from the path that it should have been following. What's really scary is that there wouldn't be any indication about this failure in the cockpit. The FMA or the flight mode enunciator would still say LOC, meaning that as far as the pilots were concerned, the capture had been successful and everything was all right. In an even rarer case, the plane would even start the descent down to the runway, thinking that it was lined up with the runway, when the plane wouldn't even be headed towards the runway. It's obvious how this could be a problem. Think of a situation in bad weather where the pilots are struggling to find the runway and they're running a bunch of checklists right before landing. It isn't far-fetched to think that they might not notice such a small change from the cockpit, especially if it's dark outside. It's mistakes like these that could fly planes into mountains. 
and Flight 645 was almost one of them. Now, the question is, how do you fix a problem like this? Well, since this was a software problem, the fix was a software update. One thing that they did was separate the criteria that triggered the CLC mode from the criteria that triggered the LOC mode, meaning that they weren't so intertwined anymore. One could activate independently of the other. Another thing that they did was to add some flexibility, which meant that a quick activation of the mode wouldn't send all of the FCMs into a state of panic. With the new software, even a quick activation of the CLC mode would keep all of the FCMs in agreement. The software update was applied in 2020, and so far, no other Boeing 787s have been led astray. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe. So that's uh, CF-101 Voodoo Interceptor, nuclear capable. I would say pretty badass. I'm gonna go in and see if they've got the keys to fire up that thing. See you in the next video. Okay, that was, I kind of like that. I kind of like that. I think we got it. I think we got it. Looks like a hippo plane. Did you say hippo plane? I said hippo. Because look at this slim beast That's right here. Sleek. Sexy. Sleek. And then look at that. That's like... But that's just, it looks more like a cargo plane. Like well, she's like, it, it, she, it she's is. like, she has, she has girth. She has all, I know it's a cargo plane. It's, okay, wait, we're gonna flip it over. Yeah, it's, you're in the ass.